house on Russell's Mills Road in Durham, David Lewis Gifford was born. The date was September the 18th, 1844, and it was here and in the neighborhood around at the head of the Ponagansett that David played and grew up. Close to home, actually just down the street, was the river itself, so David had opportunities early on in life to get acquainted with salt water, including both its pleasures and dangers. This is the earliest known picture of David that has come to light so far and was probably taken in his early teens. Since his home was in effect a farm, David was certainly exposed to the everyday life of a farmer. However, he was also close to the whaling port of New Bedford and must have experienced the sights, smells, and sounds around the walls which prompted him to try something other than farming. We know that by 1860, at the age of 16, he took out his seaman's protection papers to go to sea. David was undoubtedly on shipboard and away from home during the earlier years of the Civil War, for we do not hear from him again until late in the year 1863. By this date, David had matured some, and, like other local young men in those troubled times, he was eager to join the Union Army. He soon found himself a member of Company B, 4th Regiment, Massachusetts Volunteer Cavalry. Like so many other soldiers before him, David traveled south by steamboat along with a large group of fellow soldiers bound for the front as shown here in this engraving from Harper's Weekly. We next hear of David and his outfit in May of 1864. Some members of the 4th Massachusetts Cavalry became part of a larger Union force whose mission was to destroy a railroad bridge on the Charleston and Savannah Railroad thus severing a critical rebel line of supply. The expedition was planned by General John P. Hatch, shown here. However, actual command of the troops was given to Brigadier General William Burney. In the late afternoon of May 25th, Ships for the expedition began assembling near the mouth of the Ashapoo River in St. Helena Sound, South Carolina. These vessels included the Mary A. Boardman, which promptly ran aground, the Edwin Lewis, the armed steamer Plato, and the large steamboat Boston, which was late in arriving. The Lewis took the lead upriver, guided by a civilian river pilot and followed closely by the steam of Boston. Without lights, it proved very difficult for those in the pilot house to navigate. All of the vessels were supposed to rendezvous at a place in the river known as Bennett's Point, but they somehow passed the spot during the night. The vessels were occasionally challenged by Confederate guard posts, but managed to slip by. At around 11 p.m., the Boston suddenly struck hard on a mudflat. It was high tide. She was now in real trouble and well beyond her rendezvous point. A foggy dawn came all too soon. As the mist began to lift, those on board the Boston found themselves within cannon shot of Chapman's Fort. 
Captain Faircloth of the Boston, realizing his predicament, had the steam dumped from the ship's boiler, which soon proved a blessing. Over at the fort, Confederate Lieutenant Colonel John D. Twiggs spied the stranded ship through the thinning morning fog. He ordered the cannons to be loaded and soon commenced using the Boston for target practice. The first shot from the fort missed, but the second one hit the ship's boiler, which mercifully now was empty of steam. Shot after shot now pounded the helpless vessel. Some soldiers panicked and jumped overboard. A number of these men drowned. Others got bogged down in the swampy, muddy riverbank. In the meantime, 19-year-old David and three of his friends, all in the 4th Massachusetts Cavalry, volunteered to help save those on board the stranded steamer. Their knowledge of small boat handling helped them, and in the end, they rescued all aboard that were left. This feat was accomplished in spite of continuing heavy enemy cannon and small arms fire. In the end, there was no way to save the Boston. Orders were given to fire the ship, which was done consuming all above the waterline. The date, May 26, 1864. Due to the official report written by Dr. George Brush of Brooklyn, who himself took part in the rescue as commander of the only boat available, and which David and his friends used in the rescue, the federal government in January of 1897 awarded David and the other rescuers our country's highest award for bravery, the Medal of Honor. To this day, he is the only native-born resident of Dartmouth to be so honored. On June the 5th, 1864, a mere 12 days after the rescue of those on board the Boston, David transferred out of the cavalry and into the United States Navy. Here, we see him sporting his new beard and wearing his Navy uniform. He remained in the Navy until the close of the Civil War in 1865, when he, like so many others, was mustered out of military service. What now? For some seven years following the rebellion, David Gifford kept a low profile. It's possible that he shipped out on a whaler, or that he worked his family's farm in Dartmouth. At any rate, he was in love, and on April the 10th, 1872, he married a hometown girl, Helena Gifford, who lived not far away from his own childhood home. By June of 1872, we find David heading out to sea again on another whaling voyage. This time, though, he went as captain of the bark China. The voyage was to last some two long years before he returned home to Dartmouth. After arriving back in Dartmouth in 1874, David and Elena spent some months together before he was given command of the whale ship Young Phoenix in the following year. This time, though, David took his wife with him on the voyage, which lasted until 1878, and was highlighted by another great rescue far, far from home. While cruising for whales in the southern Indian Ocean in January of 1876, Captain Gifford spied a distress signal coming from the remote Crozet Islands. Investigating the situation, he and his crew discovered 44 survivors from the wreck of the British ship Strathmore, which had gone down in June of 1875. David had the survivors taken aboard the young Phoenix, carefully cared for, and brought safely back to civilization. The British people were so grateful that both captain and crew were showered with honors and gifts. 
Some of these honors can be seen today in the Whaling Museum of the Old Dartmouth Historical Society in New Bedford. They include a gold watch, diamond ring, silver pitcher, gold locket, and silver medal, all tributes to a brave captain and crew, even though, as Captain Gifford once stated, quote, we only did our plain duty, which was what anyone would have done, unquote. David had only minimal experience in the Arctic, but in 1881, he brought the whaling bark Daniel Webster up into the area looking for whales around Point Barrow. This move, however, proved fatal for the ship. On July the 2nd, the ice sheared off the bottom of the vessel, sinking her in 20 minutes. Those aboard had only enough time to throw some provisions onto the ice and get off the doomed whaler. After weathering this disaster, one would think David had enough of the Arctic. However, in 1884, he became part of the three-ship rescue crew that saved the remaining few survivors from the Greeley Arctic Expedition. One of the vessels that rescued the seven survivors was the Cutter Bear, shown here among the Arctic ice off Point Barrow. Gifford himself was aboard the Alert at this time. As the 1800s wore on, and between whaling voyages, David and Eleanor bought a small farm on Russell's Mills Road, where he tried his hand at an occupation he had known in his youth. Apparently, he did not fare as well as a farmer as he had as a sea captain. The couple remained very poor, living in relative obscurity. At one point, David had to sell his gold watch to a relative just to raise needed cash. The end came on Wednesday, January the 13th, 1904, when David quietly passed away. On the 16th, the New Bedford Evening Standard carried a story about his exploits, called him a hero, and that was that until the 1999 Dartmouth Annual Town Report rekindled interest in Captain Gifford. How about Eleanor? David's wife lived quietly for many more years, but finally joined her husband on April the 27th, 1931. With a renewed interest in David Gifford and his many accomplishments, a committee was formed in town. It was made up of both residents and others that felt Gifford merited being remembered and honored. This was really brought home when it became known that Dartmouth was one of very few communities in our state without a Civil War memorial. The committee adopted the name Dartmouth Veterans Memorial Park Committee has been active in sponsoring various related functions to raise awareness and money for a monument to Gifford. In early July of 2001, the Dartmouth Select Board received a letter from the Adjutant General's Office, Army National Guard, stating that Private David Lewis Gifford was going to be invested into the Massachusetts Medal of Honor Hall of Fame on September the 15th 2001. A large delegation from Dartmouth went to the ceremony, which was held at the Massachusetts National Guard Military Museum in Worcester, and proudly witnessed the investiture proceedings. Let's take a look at what transpired.
So good morning and welcome to this ceremony honoring the 64 soldiers of the Massachusetts Militia and volunteers who were awarded the Medal of Honor during the Civil War. My name is Colonel Len Konerchuk, the Director of Historical Services and the Director of the Massachusetts National Guard Museum and Archives. Our goal is to list the name of every citizen of the Commonwealth awarded the Medal of Honor. Last year we honored the soldiers of the Massachusetts National Guard. Next year we will recognize the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard and Air Force. As far as I know, Massachusetts is one of the very few states that has honored all of its Medal of Honor recipients in such a way. Sergeant Levi B. Gaylord, 29th Infantry from Boston. Private David L. Gifford, 4th Cavalry from Dartmouth. I would now like to ask Brigadier General Keith and Captain Kelly to step forward and unveil the plaque. There he is, yeah. And uh, down to Gifford. His funeral was the only one they allowed to flag out of the state house. There he died in 87. Oh, they put, yeah. They put the flag that he carried, it had the blood, the blood stains on it. They put it over his casket. That's the only time a flag has come out of the state house. Yeah. Soon after the ceremony in Worcester, the committee received the startling news that the wreck of the steamer Boston had been found back in 1979 with the actual excavation beginning in June of 1981. Many artifacts were found by the diver archaeologists. The committee made contact with the chief diver in charge, Mr. Howard Tower. He sent back a great deal of archival information and photographs of the area and retrieved artifacts. Here, a diver is getting ready to enter the Ashapu River at the wreck site of the Boston. Going down right over the wreck in very murky waters. Some of the copper sheathing from the ship. A piece of cloth survived the shelling and fire and still bears the label of Bent and Bush, military outfitters from Boston. Some soldier probably dropped this pipe tobacco tamper as he scrambled off the Boston. Would you believe it's still intact, a real piece of hardtack or biscuit for food, though turned rather black with age. Here we see a fork from the ship's dining room along with buttons, buckles, a pipe, coin, and part of a horse's hoof. On the box are two uniform brass buttons two stateroom door labels, and spent cartridge cases from Spencer carbines. Among these artifacts are two coins, a saddle shield, cross sabers insignia, and some fasteners for horses' tack. Okay, it's nice that everybody came out on this uh, rainy day. I'd like to start now uh, with a brief idea 
of David Giffords' life. And um, we have some information here which I'd like to acquaint all of you with that I feel is important about him and his life. His, uh, life. Fellow townspeople and friends, we are gathered here today to honor one of our own residents who truly deserves to be known as a hero, humanitarian, whaling captain, and soldier. As a member of the 4th Massachusetts Volunteer Cavalry during the Civil War, Private David Lewis Gifford, age 19, volunteered along with three of his friends to attempt the rescue of both soldiers and sailors aboard the stranded steam transport, Boston. The vessel was grounded in the Ashapoo River, South Carolina, and under the guns of Confederate artillery in Chapman's Fort. On May 26, 1864, the rebels opened up with heavy cannon fire on the Boston just after dawn. Private Gifford and his three friends were finally able to rescue most of those aboard the stranded vessel, though under constant fire. He was awarded the Medal of Honor on January the 21st, 1897, after being highly recommended by his superior officer. Later in life, as a whaling captain, he also effected heroic rescues, first in the Crozet Islands, south of the Cape of Good Hope, and later in the Northern Arctic ice. We today have good reason, after some 99 years after his death, to pause and honor this fine soldier and mariner, one of Dartmouth's truly great native sons. I would like the family to come up. We're going to uncover the plaque at this point, but before, but before we do, uh, Mr. Gagne, It is fitting on a day today, Memorial Day, that we take recognition of David L. Gifford's achievement. David L. Gifford was a veteran, like all of the veterans that are honored today, for what they gave for their country and many who gave their lives. David L. Gifford was involved in the conflict that tore these United States apart, but David, like other veterans, put to the cause all of his spirit and dedication. So it is fitting today that we take recognition of his achievement and receipt of the Medal of Honor. Thank you.
Not very long after the formation of the Dartmouth Veterans Memorial Park Committee, the group was approached in the summer of 2001 by Professor Richard J. Creighton from the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. As part of the art department activities, Professor Creighton offered to help create a statue of Gifford and enlisted the services of John Pelletieri, a highly talented student in his senior year. With the blessing of the university administration, as well as their financial help, work steadily progressed and the completed plaster statue, some one and one half times life size, was unveiled at a press conference on October the 17th, 2002. Reviews were very positive. What remains at this date is only to raise enough funds to bronze the statue. David should soon be able to take his rightful, well-earned place in the history of the town of Dartmouth.